If everybody wants to go ahead and find 1 John chapter 1 in your Bibles, 1 John chapter 1. We'll be in the first four verses today. A.W. Tozer once said, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So what we believe about Jesus is the most important thing. This is what determines our, our values, our, our goals in life, and, and what our priorities are. It's the, the single most important piece um, to look at when we look in the mirror. You know, I've talked about looking, looking at that person in the mirror that looks back at you. What we think about God, that's the most important thing that we can, we can judge about that man that looks back at us in the mirror. If I start to stray with, with what I believe about God and what I believe about Jesus, uh, then that's pulling, off, pulling Jesus off of the throne and putting something else on the throne. This is why we must know what we believe about him. It's not a, it's not a, a thing to just think about in some times and some days. This is very important that we must know what we believe about Jesus. And that's why I'm calling this, this sermon Authentic Faith. And really, you see this theme through the entire book of 1 John of authentic faith. But when I look at this, this scripture today, and, and, and when, I, when I know that I believe what it says, then, then it should be producing authentic faith in my life. And that's something I think that we, we fall short of a lot, a lot today, is, is having this authentic faith. We've made what we believe about Jesus a secondary issue, not, not the primary issue. So just a little bit about the book of John, the book of 1 John, not John, 1 John. It could get confusing. Uh, there's a lot of Johns in the Bible. But it was written by the Apostle John, not, not John the Baptist, uh, but, but the John that Jesus called to be one of his disciples. And, and John wrote this to expose uh, a lot of the, the false teaching that was happening in his day. A lot of this false teaching was rejecting the, the incarnation of Jesus, the, uh, the fact that Jesus came down and actually lived a human life uh, just like me and you do. Uh, some of the topics that are discussed in this book are, are the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Jesus, uh, what eternal life is, the Holy Spirit, trials and tribulations, Antichrist, and, and even false teachers. And we will see this over the next uh, many, many weeks as we uh, learn about this book of 1 John. The, the probable audience would have been the churches in Asia Minor, which is the country of Turkey today. Has anybody ever been to Turkey? Me either. I enjoy Turkey, but I've never been there. But the theme that, that, that is throughout this book is that we should have assurance of our faith. And, and a strong foundation of our doctrine, of, of what we believe of the Bible. So the teachings of this book should be foundational for us as Christians. So like I said, we're going to be in 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and I will go ahead and read that for us. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you the, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that which you also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Heavenly Father, I ask you to, to soften the hearts of all of us today. 
God, I know as I have studied this scripture this week that, that I have been greatly convicted of some areas in my life. God, I pray that, that we all leave here with, with a greater understanding of, of who Christ is to us and, and how that should affect our lives. And God, we thank you for this time that we get to spend together this morning and being able to open up your word. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful and holy name. Amen. So today I want to take this passage and I want to, I want to break it down a little bit for us and, and show us how it applies to us today. You know, it's good to read scripture, but, but a lot of times we need to, to see what it says and see what it, what it says to us today. And, and in this passage I see a progression and we're going to see that. So first John tells us that we, we believe because we see. We believe because we see. And he opens it up, he says, that which was from the beginning. So the beginning of the book of 1 John is one of four great beginnings uh, that we see in Scripture. We have Genesis 1-1 that spoke of the, the creation, the beginning of, of all the natural things that we see. Then we have Mark 1-1, which tells us the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have John 1 1, not 1 John 1 1, John 1 1, which reveals the Word, who is God, uh, which was at the beginning. And we have right here in 1 John 1 1, where John reveals Jesus Christ to us, who was God incarnate. But this is more than just an introduction of the person of Jesus Christ. This is the claim that Jesus was the eternal God. It says that, that he is from the beginning. That means that Jesus was not made. He was at the beginning. He was there. He is not a created being. It is easy for us to think of Jesus as, as little baby Jesus that was born in the manger. But that is not only who Jesus was. Jesus is God. He was at the beginning. It says he was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He was... Before the beginning, he was at the beginning, and he is from the beginning. John 8, 58 says, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is the eternal God who came to earth in the form of a man. And then John continues, he says, Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. So, so he begins it by showing us the eternality of, of Jesus. And now we look at the, the humanity of Jesus. The incarnation of Christ. We must remember that, that this is no fairy tale for, for John who wrote this. John was one of Jesus' closest followers. We were not able to witness these things. We live in the year 2022. So John is one of our eyewitnesses that we must trust, that we must look to when it comes to the life of Jesus. And in this first verse, John says three things about Jesus that concerns his earthly incarnation. First, he said that they heard Jesus. The apostle spent three years with Jesus here on earth. Uh, while he was doing his ministry. He, they worked with him, they followed him, and, and, and they heard his teaching. And these men left their lives so that they could go do this. They had jobs, they had family, um, but they decided that, you know what, this man, there's something different about him, and, and, and I'm going to go, I'm going to lay down everything I have and, and go follow him. Peter, who was one of the twelve, said to Jesus in John 6, said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. That was enough for them to know that they must lay down everything that they have to follow this man. Because of the words that he said. He had the words of eternal life. 
And John believed the words of Jesus because he was an eyewitness of what Jesus said and, and what he did. And then we see that they saw Jesus. John says that, that they saw him with their own eyes and they looked, looked upon him. John says this three different times in the first three verses in, in 1 John, that they saw Jesus. So we know that this is, this is important. You know, when you're growing up and your mama tells you three times something to do, then it's pretty important. you you, you got to listen to her. So the apostles, they, they were with him for three years. They were, they were watching Jesus do his ministry. They were intently watching his every single move. If Jesus would have shown them any indication that he was not who he said he was, then they would not have followed him. But they were the eyewitnesses of Jesus. They saw the, the words that he spoke. They saw the miracles that he performed. And then lastly, he says that they touched Jesus. They, they, Jesus was an actual physical person. They were able to touch him. John says that their hands have touched him. He was even in the form of man. He humbled himself. He had a, a physical body. Even after Christ was crucified and resurrected, he showed himself to them in the form of a man. They thought that they were seeing a ghost, which I could understand. If I've seen somebody die and then I see them again, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wonder some things, but... But Jesus challenged them in, in Luke 24. He said, Why are you troubled and why do you doubt? Why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and touch my feet. That I have, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. They touched the body of Jesus, he was not a ghost. He was there. But also with John writing this, he was also uh, fighting against this false teaching that was arising at the time. That, I believe that's why he, he uh, said these specific things about the incarnation of Christ. There was a group called the Gnostics. And they believed that all physical things were bad and that salvation uh, happened by, by mystical knowledge. Both of these things we know to be false because Scripture tells us that God is the creator of all things, so therefore things are good. And that salvation can only happen through repentance and belief in Jesus Christ. But there was this faction of, of Gnosticism called the Docetist, and, and they believed that Jesus was either a ghost or a spirit. And that he only appeared to be human. That it was a, an illusion uh, for him to be human. This is why, why John wrote these things so that he could fight this. John, he was a literal eyewitness of Jesus Christ. He was one of them that seen him. He was one of them that heard him. And he was one of them that was able to touch him as well. So he was assuring the readers here that these claims were false. That these teachings were false. And that the sovereign God of the universe, he humbled himself and came down to earth in the literal form of a human being. So it says that that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. He ends it by saying of the word of life. Jesus is the word of made flesh. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made. John tells us that the Word was at the beginning. And then he backs it up in, in John 1.14. He says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Jesus is the Word made flesh. 
And his glory has been seen. And John is telling us about it right here. And it's because of these eyewitness accounts like, like John that we can believe because we have seen. We can believe because we have seen. And then we see that because we see, we can speak. Because we see, we speak. So verse 2, it says, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So we covered in the first verse that the incarnation of God as, as Jesus Christ, that, that he was heard, that he was seen, and, and, and that, that, that people were able to touch him. He had a physical body. But here is a fourth aspect that John, John adds right here to the incarnation. He says that we bear witness to it. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus now. I'm sure that, that we've heard this, but we also need to know that we are the mouthpiece of Christ. It is our duty as Christians to not only love and to do good things, but, but it is our duty to use our mouths to declare the gospel, to tell people about Jesus Christ. Someone once said that we should preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. Well, I have some news for you. It is necessary to use words. It is. The gospel of Jesus Christ is just that. It is using the words to tell people of Jesus. That is what we are to do as Christians. Dwayne Lifton, who was the former president of Wheaton College, says this. It's simply impossible to preach the gospel without words. The gospel is inherently verbal, and preaching the gospel is inherently verbal behavior. We must use words. You can love someone all day long, and people will know that you are a Christian by your love. But faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We are called to be people of the word. This is not something that is required just of pastors either. Some people believe that it's the pastor's job to tell people the gospel. I think that's why we've turned evangelism into inviting people to church on Sunday mornings. And that is not evangelism. That is inviting people to church on Sunday mornings. This is not spreading the gospel. This is just putting off the fact that you don't want to obey Jesus' commandments. Jesus commands us in Matthew 28. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We are not to grow the church of Jesus Christ by expecting someone else to speak the gospel to the lost. It is our jobs as Christians to speak the gospel to the lost. If you put it off, they may never hear it. You may be their last resort. We must use our words to bear the witness of Jesus Christ. And if you truly understand what the gospel has done for you, you would have this, this desire to tell others about Christ. If your neighbor's house was on fire... What would you do? Well, your neighbor's house is on fire. Their, their, their eternal house is on fire. They are destined to go to hell. And it is up to us to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. To call them to repentance. To call them to faith in Christ. It is our job. If we don't, they will die in this fire. I titled this sermon, Authentic Faith. It's because when I read the verses here, I see a foundation that, that, that we must have to build our faith on. And, and in turn, it will produce authentic faith. And part of authentic faith is seeing the importance of the gospel. And my prayer for this church is that we that we grow in desire, grow in our desire to tell people of Jesus Christ. 
I'm not saying that, that these things that, to, to, to put you down or, or to discourage you. I want this to encourage us. There are people out there who have never heard the gospel. They don't, they don't know who Jesus Christ is. They have never heard of him before. And they live right here in this town. You think that just because you live in Stanley County that everybody knows who Jesus is. I, I'm, I'm telling you, they don't. They do not know. There are people right here. Other countries are sending missionaries here because we are in such a need of gospel proclamation. We desperately need the gospel and not, not this easy believism that, that, that is going on. We went to a concert last night, me and some of the folks here. And don't, don't get me wrong, it was great. It was great. Some of the bands were, were very good. But the speakers that would get up, all it was was an was a encouraging word. There was ne I never heard one time in the four hours that we were there a call to repentance. That's what our world has now. Nobody is calling people to repentance. The gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to repentance. So if people think that they have faith and they have never repented of their sins and turned and, and, and made an effort to, to live this righteous life, then, then they don't know the gospel. Because we have seen, we speak. That is us telling people the gospel. Us speaking. Next, we see that because we see and we speak, we fellowship. Because we see and we speak, we fellowship. We see that in verse 3. It says, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What we have seen and heard, these things about Jesus, the, the, the incarnation, the, the, the spreading of the gospel, these things that we have seen and heard. John has, has seen Jesus minister. He saw, he saw Jesus get arrested. He saw Jesus get murdered. He also saw him resurrected too. He saw him conquer death. And then he saw Jesus ascend into heaven. These are the things that John has seen and heard. And now John is declaring to, to its readers, which today is us, these things. So why is John declaring this? So that we may have fellowship with him. So that the, the readers may have fellowship with, with each other. We love this word fellowship. Especially in Baptist churches, because usually that means food. And I love getting together and eating and, and hanging out. I love that. Getting to know people better. But, but John is not talking about a potluck dinner on Sunday after church. The word fellowship here is, is deeper than that. The Greek word for fellowship here means to, to share in anything that you have with someone. I believe I, I spoke on that recently here. That it means to have an, an intimate relationship with someone else. That is fellowship. This close bond that, that cannot be broken. And we see this in, in the book of Acts. Acts 2.42 it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is describing the, the first church in Acts right here. They were coming together like a family. These things that, that families do together, breaking a bread and, 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 and doing family Bible study and, and praying together, these are things that we should do as families. We have a hard time doing these things, it seems, today in the church. 
In Acts 2, uh, 46 and 47, it says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And we wonder why we don't see conversions today, that we don't see professions of faith like we used to like they did in the book of Acts. I'm not saying this is a, is a prophetic word or is a, a prophecy, but maybe the reason that we're not experiencing people joining the church and, and repenting of their sins and believing in Christ is that we lack the fellowship that the early church had. I don't know how many people I've heard say that they don't go to church because church people don't get along. We've seen churches split over silly things. And people wonder why people aren't repenting of sins and believing in Christ. Well, a lot of that has to do with our witness as churches. But John goes a little bit further here with his explanation of of, of fellowship. It says, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So this fellowship is not only meant for, for each other, for for, for me and you to have with each other, but it's meant for us to have with God and with Jesus. I use the word intimate to describe the word fellowship. Now, I'm, I'm weary of using words like that because I don't want people to have a, a, a weird feeling about it, but, but the kind of relationship that we must have with, with Christ is intimate. Um, just like a husband and a wife knows everything about each other or should know everything about each other. Sometimes that, that don't always happen. We, we, have, we have lost this, this thought of intimacy uh, with each other. But Jesus knows my greatest sins and, and my, my darkest thoughts. He knows these things about me. There are things that my wife may not even know about me that that Jesus does. So we need to treat this relationship that we have with Christ as the most intimate relationship that we can have. My wife is so important to me and I love her so dearly. But I can't have a good relationship with my wife, a, 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 a holy, a righteous relationship with my wife without first having a a deep, a holy, a righteous, an intimate relationship with Jesus. That is fellowship. So because we see and we speak, we have this fellowship with each other. And not only with each other, but we have it with Jesus Christ and, and God our Father. And because of this, lastly, our fellowship creates joy. Our fellowship creates joy in verse 4 he says and these things we write unto you that your joy may be full so so he says these things we write unto you so let's do a quick review real quick of all the things that that he had said uh, about how christ is god how how he was before the beginning he was at the beginning and he was from the beginning he is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end He is the earthly incarnation of the sovereign God of the universe. He was a literal man. He had flesh and bones. He was not a spirit. He was not a ghost. Jesus walked this earth. He talked. And he used these words to teach those around him. And with that, they took what Jesus taught and spread it around. That's how we we ultimately get these books that we have called the New Testament. It's because of the the spreading of of the words of Christ. For those who heard the words of of Christ and repented of their sins, we now have this fellowship that, that John spoke of. Not only do we have this fellowship with each other, but we have this fellowship with God our Father and with our Savior Jesus. These are the things that that he has written. So why did he write these things? That your joy may be full. 
that your joy may be full. Is this not one of the goals in our life? To have joy, to be joyous. It tells us that our joy will be full because of what was written. But does it not come just to us by reading? It comes to us by belief in the words that, that are written. The object of our joy is Jesus. My wife may, may bring me happiness, but true joy will only ever come from Jesus Christ. I thought I knew what joy was until I, until I actually had this relationship with Jesus. Jesus was the Savior who came to this earth. He was crucified. He was murdered and he was buried. But then he defeated the grave. And he ascended into heaven. My joy comes from the fact that there is nothing that I can do to atone for my sins. I could try to make sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. But I can't do it. The only, the only atonement for my sins is the perfect sacrifice when Jesus went up on that cross and, and bled and died for my sins. He was the propitiation of my sins as we read about a couple weeks ago. He paid the price that I should have paid and died the death that I deserve because I was never able to pay that price myself. So this is where we, we take a look at ourselves today. We must see this passage and see the end result of these things and, 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 and see that and take an examination of ourself. When we, when we read 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, and we look at ourselves, are we experiencing this joy that he speaks of? Everything that we talked about from this passage should should show us whether or not we have this authentic faith that it speaks of. And we know when we have this authentic faith, if, if we believe that Jesus was the actual person who lived here on earth, that, that this faith is real. That this is not, not a surface level faith. Not just coming to church on Sundays and hearing a good word. So we can feel good about ourselves before we go back to work and cuss out our coworkers and, and disrespect everybody we can come across. If we believe that he was truly God that, that, that came in human form, and, and from this belief we have fellowship with each other, and not only that, but we have fellowship with God and with Jesus, we have this authentic faith, and because of that authentic faith, we have joy. We have joy. But to experience this joy, we must have repentance and faith in Christ. That is the only way we will ever experience joy. And this scripture shows us that today. That if we don't believe these things, then we will not have authentic faith. And we will not have this joy that everybody seeks after. And that's where I want us to, to stop today, to... to to end this is look at ourselves. Do, do we truly believe what the scripture says here that, that Jesus was the incarnation of God our Father? That the, the sovereign God of the universe came down to earth. He humbled himself to become flesh and, blown, and bones to, to live this life on this broken earth just as you and I have. But to also live that perfect life that we could not have lived the one that we should have lived and died the death that we deserved and that he rose from the grave and, and ascends into heaven and he's sitting right there waiting on us. If we believe that, then we have this authentic faith. But if we don't, I want, I want us to, to take a moment and, and repent of our sins. Repentance isn't just for those who don't know Christ. We, we as Christians are still called to repent because we still have sin. So let's, 
as we as we sing our last song, let's let's uh, let's spend some time in in thought and in prayer of our of our own lives. And and if you don't uh, have this authentic faith, if if you want to come down, I I would love to talk to you. I would love to talk to you. So Heavenly Father, as we as we think about what you have said to us here, as we, as I like to say, take a look in the mirror and see that man that's standing looking back at me. Does he have this authentic faith? Does he, does he truly believe that you were God who humbled himself to come down to earth and live this, this earthly life and die for the sins of the people? Are you the one that, that because we believe these things, that it, that it causes us to, to want to tell everybody we know, to want to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world, to have this fellowship with not only each other, but with you? to seek after this, this joy that you speak of so that we can experience it to the fullest. God, let us remember this as we leave here, as we, as we go back to our everyday lives. Let us remember that. And if we're not believing these things, if we're not living these things out, God, place a conviction on our lives so that we may repent and turn back to you. And I pray these things in Jesus' wonderful and holy name. Amen.